talk about <clears throat> the sinfulness of sin. I'm going to let that sink in just for a minute. Because sin has changed in the last several years. Just as not, things are just not as sinful as they once was. And what once was categorized as sin, well, it's, it's not sin anymore. Sin is subjective. That means whatever you think is sin to you is sin. And he doesn't get mad. Oh, I don't know what he was. <clears throat> Just that quick. But everybody has this new definition of sin. And I know that by the lives that we live. Well, I know when I sin. 99% of the time, I sin willfully, but I know when I sin. And the Bible says that if we say that we have not sinned, that we made God a liar. So, thank God for the ministry of forgiveness, yes, and grace from God. Let me read Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6, and we'll probably travel down through verse 12. And then I want to help us to understand how important it is for us to know what sin really is and how sinful sin is. So if you would, you can stand when you find your place in Romans chapter 5, verse 6. Now, I don't know how you study the Bible, but good gracious, if you ever started in Romans chapter 1 and you dug like an excavator until you get to chapter 16, man, your heart be blessed through Romans. Paul talks a little bit about everything from Genesis to Revelation in the book of Romans. But I want you to listen as I just excerpt just a little bit from this wonderful epistle. It says in verse 6 of chapter 5, when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Can I tell you? You ungodly. We ungodly. At best, Isaiah says we're filthy rags. And that's at the best. And most of us never at our best. We ungodly bunch of people, I'm telling you. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us. Isn't that awesome? Can I just stop telling you, you're not lovable? Some of you wives love your husband, they're not lovable. Some of you... Husband, love you. We're not love. Think about that. What is there about us that God would love us? Ain't nothing. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, say it together with me, for all have sinned. Let's pray. Father, we do ask that you would reveal unto us tonight what you want us to know. May it burn in our hearts. And even though the world wants to redefine sin, help us to have a biblical view of sin so that we can be more like Christ each and every day of our lives. 
For Jesus' sake, amen. On January the 16th, 2003, the space shuttle Columbia lifted off for what was supposed to be a routine flight. That's probably before you were born there, Stephen. Shortly after liftoff, a piece of insulating foam from the shuttle's external fuel tanks broke off and struck to Columbia's left wing. This action was caught on video, but it was presumed that no serious damage had occurred. However, serious damage had occurred. The foam from the fuel tanks punctured the wing's thermal protection system. The seriousness of the damage became evident when Columbia reentered the Earth's atmosphere on February the 1st. The damaged wing was no longer protected from the extreme heat caused during the reentry. The shuttle disintegrated in midair, killing all seven astronauts. NASA's failure to correct NASA's failure to correctly assess the damage prevented it from taking action that could have avoided the devastating results. Mankind faces a similar but more tragic situation. Shortly after creation, Adam sinned. With Adam as the head, the whole human race fell under God's condemnation. Adam first disobeyed God, found himself naked before God, hid himself from God, which forfeited his relationship with God, and he blamed someone else. Sin now rules every unregenerate heart, and if hard in this way, it would destroy and damn every soul. Every time I hear an individual say, I can't believe people say those things. I can't believe people live that way. I just can't believe people are that way. Can I tell you, unless the heart is regenerated, then the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. I'm convinced the only reason that mankind doesn't do worse is because there is a restraining power that keeps them from going too far. Don't you remember in Genesis 6 where it says that God saw the hearts of man, imagination was evil continually? I mean, they were wanting to always come up with something that was more vile and more ungodly than the last time. In fact, in Proverbs says that a man will go to bed early, uh, go to bed late and rise up early to do mischief. I mean, listen, without the very grace of God in the heart of an individual, then that person is in danger of doing anything and everything that defiles the very nature of God himself. And people wonder, they like the idea of God being a loving God and a compassionate God and a caring God. But let me tell you something. God is a wrathful God as well. And he is a judging God. In fact, a very colorful illustration is in Revelations when it says that he will squish men until their blood flows like a wine press. When the very bowl of wrath of God feels to that point, God is going to burst out his wrath, and he's going to make man wish they never was born to begin with. I want you to realize that sin is what destroys what we have in America today. If sin is what makes people do what they do that is so ungodly. And I'm afraid that one reason maybe that they go as far as they do is because the church doesn't stand up for what sin really is. Preachers are scared that they may lose their job. They're, they're afraid that Maybe if they preach sin, that people would leave the church and go to another church. Whatever the reason, we don't preach sin as sin needs to be preached. 
Now, one of the most famous sermons in history, I think it was Jonathan Edwards preached it, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. You can read that off the Internet. You ought to go and download that and read that. And the Bible says that he wrote out his sermon. And afraid that people would respond out of emotion and not reality, he did not fluctuate his voice. He just read what he wrote on a piece of paper. And they said before he got halfway through the sermon, people were crying out and coming to altar and begging God to forgive them of their sin. Let me tell you what, how can an individual be saved unless they understand just how ungodly they are? Whenever the rich young, wrong, rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what must I do to be saved? And he, wa <coughs> he walked away and he kept his riches. It's because he didn't see just how sinful he was. Well, sin needs to be exceedingly sinful and we have dumbed down the scriptures to accommodate people and sin is not seen sinful anymore and people i forgot about this i was going to look this up i thought about it one time today then forgot it before it came the percentages of church people who believe that creation is exactly what genesis says God created in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. <coughs> Just a little more than half people that goes to church believe that. <coughs> and whenever you begin to look at the other disciplines in the Scriptures, you will find that people waver whether they believe it or not. And I'm not talking about some things that we may disagree on or not sure about, but I'm talking about the things that are factual in the Bible that we know people are still wavering whether God's Word is true or not. In fact, if you believe different than I do, your first statement is, don't judge me. You don't need to judge me. Let me tell you what, if the Bible says it is wrong, you've been judged. I don't have to judge you. I can just warn you of what God said. You have been judged. Let me show you something in verse 12. First of all, I want to show you the reality of sin. Adam, and I always thought this, Adam was created a perfect being. Can I just twist that a little bit? Probably not. He was created sinless. But if he was perfect, surely he wouldn't have sinned. But he had the ability to sin, and he sinned. And so the reality is that Adam sinned, and because of Adam's sin, it's been passed down from generation to generation, and we don't have to guess whether that's true or not, because the very first generation after Adam, one brother killed another brother. And from there until now, it has just been chaos. Sin is rampant. Let me tell you what. I got a little granddaughter, and when she was real little, my wife said, we're going to pick up all the stuff so she won't be fooling with us. And no, we don't. We're going to teach her not to fool with it. And I'm going to tell you, whenever she reached and I popped a hand, that didn't go well with her. You know, that little demonic nature began to rise up in her. You know? And I've seen that little demonic nature in children, especially in grocery stores. Oh, my goodness. Just the other day, I was in a place, and this little younger just cry, or just yell, didn't cry, yell and scream and yell and scream. And somebody said, somebody ought to do something. And I said, if it was mine, it had done been handled. Let me tell you what. We have that nature. And until a lost person can see that they are lost without Christ, and if they die in their sins, then in hell they will lift their eyes. If they cannot see the reality of that, then a lost person will always think they'll be okay. And it's a preacher's duty. What is it? Somebody said you need to preach them in hell and pray them out. That's what you need to do. But they have to 
understand that there's sin. Do you remember John the Baptist's sermon? Repent. You know what Jesus' sermon was? Repent. Let me tell you what. That's what we need more of today. In fact, I got to reading about the revival and the revivals that had happened over hundreds of years was because that men such as Jonathan Edwards or Charles Spurgeon or uh, some of those others, they began to preach sin as sinful, as exceedingly sinful. And when they began to preach that, then people understood where they stood before God and they repented of that sin and they were saved. The reality of sin, by one man, sin entered into the whole world. We're all depraved. In fact, Ephesians says we're dead in our sins. In other words, we can't react to God. We can't believe God, see God, until God awakens that spirit and begins to convict, convict that heart. Can I show you the results of that sin? And I want, you, I want to help you with this. Because it says in verse 12, so death by sin. And death was passed upon the whole world. Now, let me tell you something. If physical death all there was, that's not a bad ordeal. I mean, you don't have to worry about having being sick no more. You don't have to worry about having trouble no more. This death is not a physical death. I mean, part of it is. But what he's talking about is an eternal separation away from God. Listen, Adam walked with God in the cool of the evening every day. When Adam sinned, that stopped. That was broke. Adam was kicked out of the garden. And Adam did not understand that presence as he once did because his sin had separated him from his God. It's one thing to be physically dead. It's another thing to be eternally separated away from God. You know what hell is? Without God. You know what heaven is? With God. That's the only distinction as far as I'm concerned. If you go to hell, there is no God there. If you go to heaven, God is there. And that is what makes heaven heaven, and that's what makes hell hell. Death. And it says, but there is a release for that sin. Look at verse 8. He said, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were the sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I don't know. There's difference of opinion. Anybody watched the movie That Passion a few years ago? Okay, some didn't want to see it, some did. You know, me, I, I need to see it because, I don't know, I, I just inquisitive like that. And, and it was amazing that it was all in Arabic, and it seemed like to make it more real. And I watched as they mutilated that man, and I thought, that's horrible, but it wasn't what Jesus faced. Jesus faced much, much worse. I mean, but it's about as close to a movie that I've ever seen that depicted the horribleness of sin. And I can think about as Jesus grew up that uh, people began to reject him, and that was horrible. And, and I thought about how that Jesus began his ministry and the Jews sought to kill him. And, and, you know, I thought about all the things that were going on that Jesus was being attacked over and over again. And then when they began to scourge him, and they began to laugh at him, and they began to beat him and strip the very flesh off of his back, I'm going to tell you what, that was horrible. And then they nailed him to a cross, and they stood him up, and they let him sit there and bleed in agony and pain and suffering. That was horrible. That wasn't the worst. When it got a certain time, God turned his back on his own son. I think the worst moment in life in Jesus' existence is whenever he lost that relationship with his father for that moment. That was the worst thing. Now, can you imagine? I don't know how long eons is. 
But Jesus and his father had always lived together. Yes? Yes. Never been separated. Never was a moment away from each other. And then at one time, Jesus began to cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the reason that God had to do it was because of the ugliness of sin. Because of the horrid of sin. Because he had to allow his son to die so that we could have life. And whenever you or I refuse that gospel message, then don't look for anything else but the wrath of God upon your life. Because I'm going to tell you something. God loves his son more than anything else. Loves his son. And whenever he allowed him to die so you could live, and you, pff, at the very name of Christ, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? Christ died for us. I, I, I just, I, it's unimaginable. Uh, you know, I preached a lot of the Bible in my time, and I can't imagine most of it. I can just tell you what it says. That's it. But he died. And that's what it says. There is a release of that sin. And for a sinner to be deceived, as I said yesterday, to think that everything is okay, it'll be all right. Let me tell you what. When you die in your sins, it will not be okay. Now, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but there is no purgatory to get prayed out in between heaven and hell in case you're not sure about what you're going to do. When your eyes close in this world, then eternity you will spend. Okay, I'm fixing to throw some genealogy on you. You know what that is? That's a study according to Gene. Some people believe that you have the opportunity to be saved until the time you die. I don't know if that's true. Now, some people may. But now, you willing to chance that? You willing to chance that you're going to have the opportunity before you die where you can be saved or not? I, I hope it's true. But I do believe that people can sin their day of grace away. When they walk away from God that final time, God may allow them to live for a few more years, and God never bothers them again. Can't, let me just tell you something. You can't be saved when you get ready. I don't know who, where that garbage can ever come from. Unless God opens that line and contacts you, unless that Holy Spirit convicts your heart, you can't be saved. God has opened up that line. And whenever you refuse God enough, God says, well, I won't bother you anymore. Now, me? If I'm talking to somebody who's lost on a deathbed, you think I witness to them? Sure. I don't know if they've done where they're at with God. Maybe God is gracious. Maybe God is merciful. Maybe God will give them the opportunity. I don't know. But maybe not. We need to see the ugliness of sin. Let me just tell you a little definition of sin. And, and this is going to hurt your feelings. Anything that God says don't do, and you do. Anything that God says do, and you don't do. Now listen, you ever heard the scripture where it says quench the spirit or grieve the spirit? Let me see if I can differentiate the two. God says, Brother Harold, you need to witness to that neighbor next door. Brother Harold says, you know what? I, you know, I don't, man, I don't know who that person is. So he quenches the spirit leading him. Or maybe Brother Pete says, I'm fixing to do something. And God says, don't do that. If you do, it will grieve my heart. And Brother Pete does it anyway. He does what the Holy Spirit tells him not to. Harold doesn't do what the Holy Spirit leads him to do. Quenching and grieving that spirit. (sighs) 
anything that we do that the Bible says is wrong, man, I'm going to tell you, uh, people just, I hate to use this word because it's an ugly word. People just stupid. They come up to me and they say, no, this ain't sin. Where do you get that from? You know, I don't know if I, if you heard this, but where did I read it? I read some of this stuff. But now they have found an older manuscripts to prove that the teaching against homosexuals was not original, but has been added in later on. I, that's what this guy said. Somebody sent it to me. And the guy said, what do you think? I said, awesome. He said, really? I said, sure, if you want to believe that. But now, I don't have to go into details. But God created a man and a woman. He made them biologically to fit together so that they can procreate and fulfill the earth with, with people. Um, yeah, it's a sin. Uh, even, even nature would tell you it's a sin. Let me go a little bit further. In 1 John, it says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, let me help us all because this is really good. The first thing that we want to do is compare ourselves with ourselves. That's what Corinthians says, and I love this because um, in Corinthians it says you become unwise. In the Greek, it's the word M-O-R-O-S, moros, where we get the English word moron. Well, I'm better than Stephen. <laughs> That ain't much. I'm better than Michael. That's nothing. I'm better. When you begin to measure yourself with another individual and you think that's going to let you in in heaven, let me give you a standard. Let me give you a rule. Measure yourself with Christ. And however you measure up with him, that's what gets you in heaven. And can I just tell you something? You don't even begin to get up the ruler. That's our standard. But most people want to measure it by someone else. And what we do, we always find someone worse than we are and say, well, I'm not as bad as they are. The standard is Christ. The goal is to let everybody see just how sinful sin is. Can I read you the categories of sin? You're not going to like this. Would you agree adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witch, uh, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings? We all agree? That sounds, I mean, that's good. I don't, I, I'm not a drunkard. You know, I'm not running around the neighborhood committing adultery. <laughs> not doing all that. See, so I measure myself in that category. I'm doing all right. And then in Timothy, it says, well, there are some who are covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Anybody ever been a disobedient to your parent? Disobedience to your parents? It says unthankful you ever been unthankful grumble because things didn't go your way unholy without natural affection truce breakers false accusers despisers of those who are good heady high-minded lovers of pleasure more than lovers of god having a form of godliness but denying the power, uh, the power thereof you're not going to escape this. Do you remember what he told the rich young ruler? He said, well, just keep these commandments. He said, I've done that. Cool. Have you ever noticed Christ gave him the commandments that dealt with the, the other man, a uh, 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 human? Didn't give him what he, the deal with God. You need to love the Lord thy God with all the heart. I mean, he didn't even have it. He says, you know, just obey your mother and your father and be good to your neighbor. And I've done all that. He said, okay, just go sell all you got. Do you know why Jesus told him that? To get him to understand his sin. What about the woman at the well? Whenever 
he began to say, hey, you know, go get your husband. She said, I have none. He's digging. She's not biting yet. He said, yeah, that's true. <laughs> You've been married five times and you're shacked up now. How'd you know that? She, he wanted her to admit to her sin. And then before she would admit, she said, my people say that we worship over here and your people over there. Which one's right? You know the story. Jesus says there's coming a day that we're not going to worship there or there, but we're going to worship the Lord our God in spirit and in truth. We need to admit that we're sinful. And let me help you with that. Because sin has as much to do with attitude as it does with action. Now, let me, let me, let me. Jesus says that if you commit adultery, you ought to die. Is that what he said in Matthew? He said, that's what the law says. He said, I'm going to tell you what I say. If you have an attitude of wanting to do it, you ought to die. Nobody in here has ever had a bad attitude. Ever. He said, you know, if you're a murderer, you shall die. But if you have an attitude against your brother, you're good as a murderer. He, Jesus stepped up from the law to even make it greater. Because now it's not only the action, but the attitude. And I'm going to tell you, hey, some stinking attitudes on the highway. I, I, I am just shocked at road rage. I mean, people just mean, nasty. I'm thinking, what are you so mad about? I'm thinking I ought to have a sign that said, if you had Jesus, you wouldn't be mad. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Kind of reminds me of the story. The highway patrol uh, pulled the lady over. And he, she said, what's wrong? He said, I need to find out if this car is stolen. She said, what do you mean this is my car? He said, well, there's a sticker on your bumper that says honk if you love Jesus. And I watched a couple of people honk, and you gave them a gesture. So I figured this car was stolen. Listen, I don't know how many times I've seen people who claim to be Christian have ugly attitudes. If you have an ugly attitude, there's a good possibility either you're not a Christian or the relationship is not there. Because the Bible said when Jesus was reviled, he reviled not. But he was as a sheep, dumb before his shearers. Do you know that Jesus stood up twice with anger, if I remember correctly in the Scriptures? Both time was to defend his father's honor. Had nothing to do with him. Nothing. They'd done whatever they wanted to do to him. It was all right. But whenever they were defiled his father's honor, he got him a switch, run a bunch of people off. That's a powerful man because if you understand that story, there was hundreds, possibly thousands in that courtyard that he run out of there. He had some kind of commanding voice of something. Let me give you three questions, and we'll try to close. First of all, what do you think God thinks about our sin? Now, <laughs> this is funny. I've said it before. I don't know if I've said it here. Scripture says that Christ will come as a thief in the night. And I thought if I was going to get away with something, I needed to do it during the day because I didn't want to be caught and raptured out while I was doing sin. Then I found out, you know what? It's dark somewhere all the time. Around the world somewhere. So I was out of luck there. But now, help me out, some of you old people. I can say that because officially I'm old because... August the 1st, I, I get my Medicare insurance now. I'm good. Okay? I'm good. But um, now you made me lose my train of thought. 
But us old people, there was a time when we really believed some things were wrong and some things were right. And it just doesn't seem like it's that way anymore. And if everybody in the world was perfect and you committed one sin, that's it, a thought, it would have took the death of Christ to cleanse you of that for you to enter into heaven. And every time we sin, it's like striking a blow at Jesus. They whipped him how many times with the cat of nine tails? Sir, I'm afraid we've whipped him more than that, haven't we? And Jesus just up there and he's saddened over our sin. What do you think God thinks about your sin? Well, I got scripture, but our time is gone. If you look in Isaiah chapter 6, you will find the angel saying, holy, holy, holy. I want to help you with something. What is God? God's holy. That is not an attribute of God. That's what God is. And out of his holiness comes his attributes. But God is holy. And that means nothing unholy can come before him. Nothing. That's the reason he had to send his son to die so that he can cleanse us from our sin. Second question. What do you think about your sin? Real quickly. We'll use David as an example. First thing we do is cover it up, yes? Oh, I just thought about what I was going to say a while ago. Us older people, when we done wrong, we done it in the dead of night while it was dark so nobody could see it. People are blatant with it in the middle of the day now. Not only do they not want you to judge them or accept them, they want you to celebrate their sin with them. Wow. It's amazing. Well, didn't, isn't that what David did? Try to cover it up? He tried. Or maybe you try to justify yourself. Isn't that what Adam did? Where are you at, Adam? <laughs> God? You know that woman you gave me? Yep, buddy. I was okay that I went to sleep. And when I woke up, the gorilla wasn't there, the hyena wasn't there, the giraffe wasn't there. There was a woman there, and it's been downhill ever since. I'm just telling you what the Scripture says now. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at God. But we try to justify our sin. Now, honestly, have you done something wrong and tried to justify it? I have. I've done a bunch of it. And try to say, this is the reason I've done it. I have the right or whatever. And, and I love when people say, you know what? I have the right to choose my life however I want to. Well, okay, well, that's fine. But understand, God has the right to judge you when it comes time for that day. Not only do you try to cover it up or justify it, but we get to the point, listen, that sin just doesn't bother us anymore. I'm going to tell you, when I go out in public and I see things, it don't bother me. Like, I remember it used to, wow, did you see that? Did you see her? Did you see him? But now it's just second nature. It's not that big a deal anymore. Well, let me just tell you, it's always been a big deal with God. Period. So what do you think about your sin? I'll just tell you, we ought to be ashamed. We ought to realize that the reason that Christ died is because of our sin. And the reason that Christ rose from the grave on that third day is for our justification. And one day, we'll be catapulted out of this world 
into the presence of God. Now, y'all know Romans 7. Paul says, I know what's wrong, and I do it. And I know what's right, and I don't do it. Now, this is what I like. He said, oh, wretched man, how shall I ever escape this body of sin? He said, when Christ returns. Now, let me tell you something. There's a lot of things I've thought about waiting for heaven, things I want to see in heaven and do in heaven and all that. But there's one thing that I can really get excited. I will not sin again. Can you imagine that? Never having a bad thought, never having a bad day, never saying a, a cross word, never doing a wrong deed. Isn't that going to be awesome that there is just no sin in heaven? Those of you who can't get along, y'all will get along. Just saying. We need to see the sinfulness of sin. Us pastors need to teach and preach the sinfulness of sin. And we don't need to let the world dictate to us what we think about what's going on. Can I just tell you something? You know the reason there was so much looting and rioting going on? There was no consequences, was it? Well, no consequences. I mean, why not? I saw a video just the other day where these two men walked in somewhere and just loaded up big bags and walked out, and somebody was videoing, nothing done to them. Period. There's no consequences to wrong, so why shouldn't people continue to do wrong? Well, let me tell you, God is long-suffering, but there is consequences to sin. And if you won't let the death of Christ cleanse you of the consequences, then you'll face your consequences yourself. Now, I'm going to give you a little picture. I'm going to close, I promise. At the great white throne judgment, all the lost will stand before Christ to be judged. I also believe, genealogy, that all the saved will be standing behind the throne. And when Christ condemns them to hell, we will say glory to God, amen and amen. Not because we want people to go to hell, but we want Christ to be honored. We want Christ to be glorified. We want God to be exalted. We want his name to be vindicated. That may or may not be. But one day, God will return. Christ will return. And if you're not saved and you can't see how awful your sin is, then you shall spend an eternity in hell. Period. That's a horrible place to be. Especially since you don't have to be. My grandmother worked at a hospital in New Orleans. You know what the worst ward was on the whole hospital? The burn ward. She said that was the worst smell and the worst cries and the worst agony of everybody that ever come to the hospital. And the Bible says, and you shall burn in hell forever. That's horrible. Let's pray. Father, I need more than ever to see the sinfulness of sin, even as being a Christian. I struggle, and I struggle hard. But this world is so ungodly. And I know that it won't be long before you come and you cleanse this world of its ungodliness. But my prayer is for those that are here lost, that they can just see how sinful that they are. And they would cry out to Jesus and be saved before it's too late. Please bless your words. And may you bring fruit as you see fit. For Jesus' sake, amen.